Good evening, everybody. And on behalf of the entire team at Edelweiss Mutual Fund, uh, we hope you are safe and happy wherever you are. Uh, and we are delighted to welcome you this evening to one more conversation uh, on Connect. Uh, given everything that's happened in the markets, um, and given actually everything that's happening in the world, forget markets, uh, it's actually a very good time and a very topical time to do uh, Connect. Uh, but before I come to that, uh, you know, let me interview, uh, introduce our guest for the day. Uh, Tamil is a face that many of you are familiar with. So uh, welcoming Tamil Bandhopadhyay. Um, he is an author and consulting editor at Business Standard, uh, also senior advisor to Jan Small Finance Bank. Um, and he was advisor till 2018 for India's newest universal bank, Bandhan Bank. Um, which was really the first instance of a microfinance entity transforming into a bank in India. Um, and uh, he's someone who spent time with four major dailies in India, Business Standard, Financial Express, Mint, and ET. Many of you know him for his weekly column, Bankers Trust, now in Business Standard and before in Mint, um, and for his deep insights into the world of finance finance and banking, um, which we will be grilling him on. He's, he's kept a very close watch on the entire financial sector uh, for the last two decades. And I think he has a great view of the kind of changes that have happened in Indian finance over this period. He, of course, has authored now six books on banking and finance. Uh, many of you would have read them, including HDFC Bank 2.0, uh, The Sahara Story, Bandhan, The Making of a Bank and a Bank for the Buck. Um, all, of, all of them have been bestsellers and he's the recipient of the Ramnath Goenka, uh, Aware for Excellence in journal, uh, Journalism, uh, recognition. So, Tamal, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and we're really excited to have this conversation with you. Thanks. Thanks, Radhika. I don't know whether I'm excited because I don't know what you are, <laughs> what you are going to ask me. It's on the other side. Normally, I play your role, but uh, you're welcome. Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, whatever. <laughs> Lovely. I, I, I love grilling journalists. I, I, I love having this other side situation. So uh, let me start with the elephant of the room. As I said, uh, you can't not start with a question on everything that is happening geopolitically. Um, and it's it's not been a minor week. Uh, we are wrapping up Friday with a, you know, a pretty eventful week. Um, so let me ask you this. How do you see this crisis in terms of macros? And how do you see sort of what can change for India amidst this crisis? Well, Radhika, I, um, well, I, I know you can't afford to start a conversation on on this Friday uh, when you're talking about Indian economy without this. But unfortunately, I'm not an expert, geopolitical expert. So with that caveat, um, let me say I mean, I, I don't see there's any much of India's role over here because it's the, the at the center is the NATO, the treaty is at the center where the 30 members already there and we, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine wants to join, but it's against Russia's wish. And if indeed Ukraine joins with NATO also wants, then they can collectively, uh, you know, um, uh, I would say confront Russia. So that's that's the political issue over there, uh, geopolitics. Now, what does India, uh, uh, how does it affect India? I think first thing you have seen that uh, the the crude price it crossed uh, one thousand dollar. Um, I think this is the highest since September fourteen. Uh, so this is the biggest impact uh, will be the global crude price, even though. In, uh, uh, India's import of oil, etc., from Russia is negligible, uh, but crude has uh, its weightage on our inflation. So the biggest impact on in, on India, if it continues and escalates further, uh, which I would like to believe it would not, uh, definitely um, the one area which would be really be careful about uh, the inflation. So RBI's inflation projection, etc. Even otherwise, people think that it is underestimated. Uh, for fiscal 2023, uh, definitely um, it would go up, uh, both WPI and, and CPI. On the import side, uh, well, I think everybody knows that sunflower oil import primarily is done from Ukraine. 
70 percent from ukraine india does yeah. it and 20 percent from russia so i think we need to look for other markets uh, like argentina like brazil etc etc we can look for that um, that's a micro issue uh, eu is the biggest market for india and exports so here we have seen a mixed thing uh, say if if there is a sort of uh, you know, sanction on Russia, then the Russian market we lose, we'll not be able to export anything. But because of these disruptions and supply side issues, etc. So, so there are there are um, uh, areas where India actually can uh, get benefit uh, for its exports to EU market in steel, engineering goods, etc. etc. Uh, it's a it's a it's a good thing for for India. Um, UK again is a agriculture production hub. Um, so we will, as I, I, I discussed about the oil part, uh, uh, this uh, sunflower oil part and all. So uh, all in all, I think the primary impact will be on inflation and on currency and on CAD, uh, because you might see rise in commodity prices also, and oil, of course, will go up. So fact, as far as India is Markets is a different animal altogether. What we are seeing, the seesaw movement, you see what happened in US market also after Biden stock, uh, the seesaw movement today also, yesterday. So market is a different animal. But as far as Indian economy is concerned, I think that primarily we need to be uh, careful about uh, on the inflation side. Yeah, Tamil, I just want to ask you an unrelated question and uh, or related question and just, you know, linked to something you said about inflation, supply side disruptions. There is a short term sort of impact. Um, but do you think there are any economic lessons for India, given this kind of geopolitical noise uh, and, uh, you know, long term economic lessons for India? Do you think there's anything long term for us to think about? No, I think I, th I think I mean I don't want to repeat. You know, there's certain treaties with certain countries which have been uh, we have been doing in terms. I'm talking about the uh, export related stuff which have been on for quite some time. They have not been concluded. Uh, the government is on the job. So I would like to believe now uh, the uh, this kind of situation would would uh, actually. Um, provoke us to conclude those those uh, kind of relationship i'm talking about the import uh, sorry export um, uh, when it comes to that so uh, that's it so uh, we are we people are talking about now china Ch what china would do to taiwan uh, taking a lesson from this uh, there are some talks about even in indian subcontinent do we see a replication of this kind of thing so I would like to believe the uh, world is pretty mature, particularly when we are getting out of COVID. Uh, we are not yet out as yet. So everybody should be cautious and things will, will improve. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm repeating, I'm not a geopolitical expert, so I'm nothing much to add. Noted. And, you know, let, let me change the conversation a little bit, of course, to your, your, your favorite sphere, which is uh, Indian banking. And you've written a lot about the evolution of banking. And banking is really, I mean, the backbone of the economy. Um, can you throw some light uh, on how you've seen the banking sector and its importance to India evolve? And also how you see some of the future trends as you look at this space? Well. Uh... We can we can discuss for hours, uh, but quickly yes, uh, because India is one of the unlike the developed markets. India is a bank led economy, uh, which is slowly changing. If you see, um, mm -hmm. uh, because of technology and this buy now pay later, those kind of models are coming up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, slowly changing, and also uh, Indian corporations are um, not as innovated or shy about tapping the bond market, which had been the case. So the dependence on banking is slowly uh, coming down. Uh, and also the bank's credit growth is not a proxy exactly what is happening. It's not catching the trend what's happening. So that's, that's where the banking stands. But structurally, we are seeing changes. Uh, you have seen we have gone through hell, literally gone through hell. 
In fact, my last book, Pandemonium, The Great Indian Banking Tragedy, uh, talks about that. Um, you know, how post um, uh, Lehman crisis, we had an ultra loose monetary policy, we paid price for that. And then there was the government, I was talking about uh, the previous regime, uh, UPA, there was, you know, there was, uh, there was a pressure on banks to lend to infrastructure in other areas. And on the other side, there are lots of other issues about land acquisitions, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the legal interference. So the, all the net result of that, and of course, banks were a little indiscriminate in their lending. The net result of that, we saw a pile of NPAs, huge NPAs, and then we saw the cleanup uh, through uh, a unique uh, operations in India and probably in the world, which is called Asset Quality Review. Uh, Dr. Rajan started it, I think, between yeah. December quarter 2015 and March 2017, banks were to come up clean. Um, you know, so essentially RBI let lose its inspectors and go and check the bank's um, books. Uh, you know, and send them literally to the bank's kitchen. Look, what you are cooking there, we don't understand. So we let me check. And that was the case. So even if the banks were supposed to come up clean by 2017, it continued uh, to, in, uh, in, if you look at the numbers, I'm not burdening with the numbers, it actually started going up even post-2017. Um, so banks were, banks were hiding, banks were evergreening, banks were not doing their risk management properly, banks were uh, following a hard mentality, banks were uh, grow, uh, focus was on balance sheet growth, not on the quality of assets. That was the, that was the story. Uh, then then um, governor change, Patel came, Patel did not uh, let it lose, Patel continued with that thing. And also Patel made it clear, look, if there is any difference or discrepancy between what you announced as NPA and what my guys have found out, and then you have to, if you're in, uh, you have to inform the regulator, meaning uh, SEBI. So you'll find that a series of banks, both private and public sector, they started telling stock market notices, look, this was my NPA uh, following the RBI uh, um, uh, norm. And in retro, I mean, had that been on the current, had that, they did it post facto uh, after doing this, but had they followed the norm, probably some of the banks would have been in losses and NPS would have been even much larger. Mm -hmm. So that's the one side of the story. Then we found that government announced two trillion plus recap uh, to compensate for that. I mean, to, to actually to take care of the bank's capital and also the consolidation drive took place. Bankers are um, uh, um, 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 becoming um, cautious about, and then there was over jealous um, uh, investigative agencies. You know, uh, many of the bankers were arrested and thrown in the jail, uh, and those are all retired bankers. Um, and but in in none of the cases they they could find they could actually fix them their criminality, and it's very easy to because it's it's very easy to. Uh, uh, arrest a retired banker and throw him in the jail because you don't you can't you can't do that uh, to a serving banker you need a lot of permissions and clearance from, from government and others now as a result of that banks gone into the gone into a cocoon over cautiousness you know mm -hmm. earlier they were hugely liberal in, in lending and now uh, after that of this despite finance ministry's continuous uh, assurance that you would not do anything without fear and favor you take decisions you ask any banker in closed door hand on heart they will say look we are scared so it, it went to the other extreme that banks became extremely cautious and they were not they were not lending uh, but then when we were getting into a situation where they were coming out of that they were ready to lend and they were cautious they were their credit appraisal and risk management getting better. Things were getting better on the capital side. There is no problem. COVID hit. That was that was the issue. And uh, to the credit of both the Reserve Bank of India and government, I think we handled it well. RBI through its policy support, monetary, and on the fiscal side, a lot of things like the credit guarantee scheme, etc., came. Uh, so as we speak, uh, we find that if you look at the banking parameters. Uh, we are we are we are we are pretty good. I think never had been in the past so good. If you you look at the December results, and if you look at individually, some of the banks uh, 
Of course, banks, most banks or all banks' cost of money is much lower now. Uh, Casa is higher, despite people who are putting in money in the market, but still there are banks, uh, bank have their money there. Um, uh, you will you will see the provision coverage ratio is pretty high. Most of the banks, 80% plus kind of thing. Um, so yeah, we are, things are things are getting better uh, despite COVID. Uh, we need to wait and watch because the restructured assets and ultimately what's going to happen, we need to wait and watch. For the time being, as we speak, uh, I think Indian bank, you will, you will see a spring in their steps. They're, they're, they're pretty confident that things are getting better. But there is another know, side to it. There is other side to it. Probably we can discuss later that everything is not hunky dory. Everything is not at least I don't see as bright as some of you guys see. We can discuss that later. And I, I am definitely going to ask you a question about that. But since you talked about sort of the journey that banks have tread through uh, from the Rajan time, asset quality review, pandemic, everything, I wanted to extend the question also to broader Indian corporates and the evolution of corporate India also over the last two major crises, GFC and then the pandemic, both for banks. Banks and I think for broader corporates, you know, what do you think has helped the guys who survived and what has hurt the people? I mean, what are the few factors that have destructed the ones who, who didn't? Well, I mean, uh, you know, if you if you see the two landmark events um, uh, more than more than say 12 years apart, which is uh, one is uh, Lehman crisis, September 2008. And now uh, in nature, they're very different. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Lehman was a man-made crisis. I mean, it happened in the U.S. and everybody, and at least some of us, uh, like uh, former Reserve Bank of India Governor, Deputy Governor Rakesh Mohan, does not agree. Uh, he say that no, it's all, it's not a global crisis. It's a transatlantic crisis. Not everybody was affected. Uh, so be that as it may, this is a very different kind of thing. And around that time, post Lehman, Indian banks were pretty liberal and giving money to the uh, to the corporations. Uh, and many of them did not use it; they misused it. Of course, there are issues of uh, export market collapsed, external issues. So depending on what you are doing, and uh, that's how some of the some of the industries got affected hugely. Um, primarily because of the extra extra market collapse and and as you know till, to, till 2013 we have this uh, double digit inflation and cat which is a historic high more the higher than our current account deficit was higher than 2000, 1991 which for which 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 provoked india to open up so Banks be at the burnt, but corporates also were affected. And in many of the cases, banks, banks, corporate passed on the problem to the banks because uh, Rajan himself said, I think not on record, that they were using banks' money both for debt and equity. You know, typically you put in your own money on the table and get, yeah. the, get, get, get equity and the debt, but the banks were doing that. Uh, so that was the case then. But the, what COVID time we found the the new uh, new corporates or the new age uh, new age companies are coming up, you mm -hmm. know, which are not dependent on on banks uh, banks money to that extent. If you look at their, I will not name them. If you look at their every new tranche of capital raise in their valuation going up and up and up and up. And if you ask this, some of these companies that uh, look. I mean, what is the distinction between value and valuation? Uh -huh. uh, they would get they would they would get very upset that uh, that's kind of thing and all. So what we are saying it's a completely different story, uh, and we need to see that whether whether this will last and how long it will last. Is it a sort of bubble which you see early this century the uh, the tech bu internet bubble? What we uh, right now that so called new age corporates. I'm not naming any them any of them. That the euphoria, uh, the I mean, how how um, will it last? Uh, the last word I want to say is this: be then and now. I again, mm -hmm. I would not like to name uh, the key uh, factor which is led to the. You said some of the corporates that got destroyed. I think the key factors that led to the destruction of the corporates. Um, there are externalities uh, which which are responsible, like 
collapse of, of certain markets on exports. Um, there are problems with business model, but the key factor is governance. Whenever, be it these new age entities or the old bricker motor uh, companies uh, a decade back, only those had problem and got into, I mean, it got themselves into trouble and some of them got destroyed. And currently also in the current corp, some of them are facing trouble and some of them will get destroyed. Those who do not care for governance, those who have handpicked people in their board, uh, the boards are big name, but, but uh, ineffective and well-managed. So the key, sen the key word is governance, I think, I think whatever, whether it's COVID or Lehman crisis, uh, if you, um, uh, the business model definitely is very important. Market is very important, but the most important part is governance. If you don't care, I mean, you can't, <laughs> you can't just uh, fool your investors and, and the regulators forever. It, it, may, it may take a little time, but you will get caught. We had seen that, we are seeing it now. I just want to ask you, and you know, uh, this was not planned, but since you touched on governance, um, and it, this sounds like a very basic question, but you know, I think governance is a word that is talked about a lot. We talk to our investors about the fact that, you know, we want to pick companies where governance is very strong. What do you think in the Indian context are three, four, if you have to make bring governance down to the basics, what are the three, four elements that define good governance? Governance is like brand. It's very easy to say, and it's harder to define and live. It's very simple. I, it, I'm plagiarizing somebody else's idea. It's it's not. I'm not. It's not my discovery or my idea. You know, if you are uh, driving a car and the traffic light turns red, you stop the car. Driving a car, traffic light is not red, is green. But if you find a child is crossing the road or a woman is crossing the road or an old man is crossing the road, not a young fellow who can anticipate and jump out, but still you stop the car on green light. So yeah. that's governance. That's governance in letter and spirit. And, and stopping the car on red light is governance only in letter. Okay, mm. so that's the basic difference. So what we find in India, I think, in most of the cases, the root problem is this: you go carried away by uh, uh, by by the numbers, by the by the board members. They are, you know, uh, where are they are from? Are they IAS guys? Are they ex regulator? Are they uh, big time and you know, all? Uh, are they compromised? Probably. A few of them um, get good money and keep their eyes closed. And many of them don't have time uh, to actually go through. They just, they just go by the motion at the board meetings and see that things are okay, all right. So it's a combination of that. I think despite the best efforts of our regulators about the number of non-independent directors or the so-called public interest directors, depending on where it is, like NSC had public interest directors, yeah. whereas in other cases of non-independent directors. Okay, mm -hmm. now the RBI new norm said that the, the chairman has to be a non-independent director, which means uh, the promoter cannot be even a chairman. Okay, after the after the CEO ship goes and all, so they've been they've been trying to address, but I think the 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 big uh, black box is the board in many many cases. So just don't get carried away by the big names. I'll not name them, big names. Either they don't have time, or they don't have the ability to appreciate the nuances, or they they trust the management too much, or some of them are happy with whatever goodies they get. So there are there is multi-dimensional, but uh, the 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 um, companies uh, I think they they many of them they try to manage the board, and mm. investors should be careful about that. And if you allow me, uh, mm. particularly in in not in corporate sector in banking sector, I find uh, like the three four types when it comes to governance. A you are a promoter, <clears throat> you are officially holding pretty good amount of you know, 20, 15, 30%, whatever it is allowed, yeah. allowed by the bank. And you are running the bank, uh, you are running the bank, you are creating value. 
um, for yourself and for others. B, mm -hmm. you are a, you are technically not a promoter. Probably you you may hold some stake Benami, but technically you are under SEVI definition. You are not a promoter. So your value is your 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 uh, stake is very low. In that mm -hmm. case, you would not really care for creating value for others and for you. You will, find, uh, you will find other ways of making money. Yeah. And uh, and then you shift to the banks which run by professionals. There are two types of uh, professionals who are good, competent, and well-governed. They want to create money for themselves and for others because of stock options, etc. And professionals who are, again, <laughs> not so good, they want to destroy value. So there are promoters and there are promoters. Uh, there are professionals. There are professionals. It's a very complex part. But my only observation is this. Just don't, let's not get carried away by the big names of the board. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to deep, uh, we need to deep, deep uh, delve deep. Interesting. So Tavan, since you, asked, since you said you talked about new age business models, I have to talk to you about new age business models. Now, of course, India is becoming, ha is actually a global leader in payments. There is, there has been a so-called fintech revolution, so to say. Lots of new age business models have come in place. I have a two-part question. One is that, you know, how will it change banking in India? How does it change things for the old school banks? Do these guys get really digitized or are they threatened? And the second question I have is more around governance. And, you know, ultimately, these are new age financial services, guys. Uh, what are the landmines there? I mean, are they going to make some of the risks that old banks have made in the past? No, it's absolutely, say, uh, uh... Uh, what is happening in the tech part is something um, I think India is at the forefront. Probably, is, probably is the market where uh, where this technology is making this kind of progress. I heard uh, Mr. Nandan Nilkani talking not now a year back that what what would have taken probably years now is happening in months or weeks. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a huge revolution. That's what we are talking about. And, and this is going to change. Uh, it is changing the uh, banking system. I think many of the banks are want to, or some of the banks want to become a digital. I mean, you don't call them, but they are becoming a digital bank, including the country's largest bank, State Bank of India. The kind of focus, I understand, they're, they're going on digitalization. Or uh, in public sector, let's talk about uh, Bank of Baroda. Uh, this too often comes to my mind. Others also are there. There's a huge, huge uh, uh, focus on technology. That's one part. Um, the new age private banks, all of them are uh, be it ICIC or Axis or Kotak and HDFC and others. Um, yes, all of them again having a uh, you know, lot of focus on. Yes, there are glitches and there will be uh, um, there'll be rating if you somebody will get triple A. Plus, somebody gets triple A, somebody triple A minus. I'm not qualified, but all of them focus. They do, they have understood that without digitalization, you can't because it's it is it is a faster delivery and it's also cutting cost. You know, one capex you do, and after that, actually it, it 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 helps you a lot. And then you you also are seeing the system of like say account aggregators. The new things are coming up where voluntarily I am sharing data and all. So everything is changing. If you see the kind of change, which um, had there been no pandemic, which would have taken a decade, probably we are doing it in two, three years. And uh, um, and it's, it's a huge positive, particularly if you look at the, if you, if you think about the financial, I mean, if you think about uh, the financial inclusion and going uh, to the hinterland. Um, a connected thing is this uh, under the PMJDY, I think 44 crore odd, 440 million plus uh, accounts have been opened. So even in the microfinance, etc., which is so called essentially only the touch model, you will find them. They are both their disbursements are all probably 99% or 98% is through banks because of the PMJDY has gone. No, they are sending money through digitally. And even in many of the cases, probably 80, 90 percent, I would not name them, collection also becoming digital. So and then um, and then then also digital also helping us for data aggregation. Uh, so the credit appraisal process also is getting better. 
So overall, um, overall, I think I, I think it is. I mean that there will be cyber frauds, etc. Um, my understanding is Reserve Bank of India also uh, also knows that uh, it needs to um, it needs to be on top of it. So internally, they are also changing how to because that's a new world for them. Mm -hmm. um, well, many of them, um, many of the investors globally also asking like your central bank is is it e equipped to manage uh, the, the new new age uh, entities kind of thing. I think RBI is doing its own homework and um, uh, would, would would make try to make sure that uh, um, it's there is no no mess up etc. So overall things are positive and. India is the most happening market, and it's uh, the the benefit is uh, it's actually the the market the credit market will expand um, the geographies where people uh, have not got credit they are being given and then then various models also are coming up now buy now pay later so on and so forth so you. Microfinance does not need to be by only MFIs. Microfinance as a concept, you know, it can be by non-MFI NBFCs, it can be by MFIs, it can be by banks. Uh, and which is why Reserve Bank of India also is coming up with the new norms, which you'll see. That's a separate story altogether. But one of the yeah. one of the biggest benefit of digitalization will be credit reaching to people which so far had not reached it much faster and that's from the one side from the borrower side and from the bank side it would be the ability to as i said the, the move it fast and uh, and the credit appraisal risk management etc so things are positive and other part is this as i hinted at that don't look at the credit figure in the reserve bank of india's wss uh, weekly statistics and you you say oh god credit is not picking up it's still single digit it's not the way of looking at things because there are entities which are in this space that that tech savvy nbfcs which are giving credit basically on the digital platform those things are not caught by by the reserve bank of india wss data so uh, we need to wait and watch how it unfolds but uh, it's 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 a happening place and it's interesting time what do you think are the landmines, Saman? What do you think we should? I mean, there's there's a lot of optimism about the space. What do you think we should worry about? No, definitely. I mean, there are issues like, for instance, one particular entity, now listed entity, which the kind of valuation which you are looking for, mm -hmm. and now you look at this. I will not again name them. Um, it's in the payment space, mm -hmm. and uh, it was creating a revolution kind of thing. But then the banks are saying, look, we. What we can't—I mean, what can you do which we can't do? Banks yeah. have, banks can do everything else. So landmine in the as far as from the investor's point of view, if you get carried away by certain models, and if you are in a hurry to put your money, mm -hmm. uh, then there will, there could be landmine because you will find that look. I mean, there are so many me too products and so many things. I may claim that I am doing I am unique and I can do. Uh, so you need to needle uh, me and you need to look at the model and what's so great about it. So from that point of view, I would see uh, it, it's a good world. It's a, it's a great thing happening from the borrowers, those who are on the other side. Um, but um, as far as the investors are concerned, there could be landmines because, as I said, uh, like payment bank, if you look at this payment bank, the entire movement, um, the Bank of India is officially would not admit, but it's a failure. It's a failure. Oh, the a few the, what has done Indian Post Office till now? Um, the Indian Post Office with its one lakh plus or one and a half lakh branches. What has this done to the payment system? The current uh, the recent budget spoke about again uh, doing a new things by the by by Indian Post Office. Uh, so some of them surrendered their uh, licenses. Uh, some of them, another payment bank which got um, a payment bank which got uh, listed has not been doing well at all. Uh, some of them closed. Um, that uh, the companies who are into some other areas, um, you know, uh, I'm I'm talking about the mobile telephony, etc. They are keeping their payment bank, but not not for as a bank per se, but for other reasons. I think it's a glue factor for their 
for their um, for their subscri telecom subscribers. But payment bank per se, uh, it's not a success story. Uh, small finance bank is still evolving. Uh, so yeah, I mean we need to be careful. Like uh, we jump onto it, uh, mm -hmm. later uh, we discovered that uh, what what can payments bank do a little extra which the normal commercial banks cannot do. So why do you need a exclusive payment bank? Because when the entire banking system is becoming a sort of digital banking system. Lovely. Now, you know, we talked, Tamil, about new age. Uh, let me go back uh, to not new age, uh, public sector banks. Uh, and they've always been sort of mixed perspectives here. But one of the trends that we've seen is, of course, the uh, big consolidation in public sector banks. Uh, um, you know, how do you see the role of public sector banks shaping up? Are you optimistic about the consolidation and how life will shape up for public sector banks ahead? Well, uh, you know, to be honest enough, uh, I think government also knows that uh, they're not uh, extremely excited about the future of public sector banks. Uh, mm -hmm. We just had this 50th year of bank nationalization. Uh, and there are a lot of discussions. So probably the time has come uh, to to rewind. I mean, you know, to take a relook. It has served the purpose. If you look at, if you talk to any public sector bankers, they they. Um, it's, I am not. I am not mocking. I'm and I'm not being sarcastic. But there's a lot of nostalgia. You will find that we build bridges. We build uh, roads. And you do look at this. We played our role. Yes, they are. Now the key critical factor is this because you are you 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 have investors as the audience. Now, do you look at them as social organization or for for building bridges and and building roads and taking care of people's uh, people or do you see them as as commercial organization? Now I think um, our Prime Minister Mr. Modi said that government has no business to be in business and which has been reiterated by our finance minister also. So they know that's what we are talking about. Two banks will be privatized beside IDBI bank. Okay. So I think that's the start. Gradually we'll see more privatization. It's not, it, nothing has happened as yet. Uh, the bill is still pending, but it will happen um, slowly, slowly. Um, because uh, if you look at them, the numbers have come down some from 24 or 26 or now to 11. Uh, but uh, one thing probably we have not noticed how their market share is coming down. Uh, I don't have the offhand number now, uh, but then typically used to say 70% of the market share, etc. It's not, it's coming down. And mostly, well, most importantly, look at the incremental market share. That's more important. Mm -hmm. In fact, in my latest book, I dealt with that. It's, it's, it's one fifth of private banks. Okay, and that's not only for the credit, even for deposits, which mm -hmm. means public sector banks are sovereign and I'll keep my money with public sector bank. That's no more the case. I am keeping my money as a depositor, even with private, not even more with private banks because they are more agile, they are more digitally savvy. I find it easy and they have grabbed my salary account and they're also paying me better rates, etc. So the you know banking is all about a business of trust. So I have started trusting them. I know that uh, they will not fail. And meanwhile, DICGC, the Deposit Insurance Guarantee Corporation, has gone up from one lakh to five lakh, so on and so forth. That also helps. So incrementally, public sector banks are losing market share hugely, hugely. Okay, and you look at the credit of take uh, in the past few years, you will find. Some of the private banks around 20%, 20% plus, some of them even higher. And public sector, you will find some of them are negative, and all of them are in single digit. Uh, so both on credit and deposit sites, they are under they are under stress. Uh, their ability to, I mean, their risk management and their their credit appraisal system, uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, have dramatically gone up, I would say, over the past few years uh, after the AQR. Um, um, so there's no question on that. They're competent, they have the structure in place, etc. But when the owner tells you to do things, I mean, do they have freedom? Let's let's look at this. Mm -hmm. If the owner 
pushes you to do things which is not financially remunerative. They have no choice but to do that. Look at PMJDY's share of State Bank of India versus other banks or mm. public sector bank versus other banks. So that's that's that tells the story. Uh, we don't call it loan mela, but we have proxy loan melas. Uh, there'll be meetings and saying that, look, we you have to support them. MSME, you have to support them. Again, look at this, uh, the credit guarantee scheme, which is now being extended by one year and five trillion. Look at the share of public sector banks and the private banks. Then you know. So yeah. I would like to believe, yes, we need a few public sector banks, but let's not treat them as, as corporate entity. Mm. That lets them treat it as a vehicle for social good. And let's accept it and let government own them 100% and let them be used for those kind of purposes. Rest of them, you, you permit off to private sector in due course, not overnight. Let this experiment with two banks and ITPI, let it, uh, let it, work, uh, let, let it work out. And then slowly, I would like to believe because, I mean, you can't work if your hands are tied. Again, uh, you ask them in private, you will tell their stories. I mean, it's not that telephone banking, etc. Those are, those days have gone. It's not that you no, know, you are getting phone and you 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 tell this entity the thing. It's it's not. But it's it's just supporting the economy, supporting certain sectors, uh, which private cap banks can be choosy to do or not to do. They can they can be discovered. So I'll not I'll not name like. There, is, there are banks which at the moment some, some, some red signal, it completely withdraws from the segment. And there are banks, there's a, at the moment there's a red signal, it's not withdrawn, but it's become much, much more circumspect who to give, who not to give. But can the public sector bank afford to do that? No, government will not allow to do that. So it's not telephone banking, it's not giving money to A and B, it's essentially to support the economy, you have to do this, you have to do that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then you can't, uh, you can't have the best of both worlds. Uh, you, you know, uh, do the social good as well as be a business entity. So I think uh, the future lies in having a few large public sector banks as a vehicle of, uh, you know, socio-economic uh, changes and helping them out, owned by the government and rest of it private sector. You know, since you've been so frank, uh, Tamil, on public sector banks, I have to ask you also about the NBFC crisis. And there was a lot of enthusiasm about the NBFC model. And then we had the crisis of 2018. You know, I, I'd love your take on the crisis itself. But I'd also love your take on NBFC 2.0. How do NBFCs shape themselves up to march ahead? And what are the kind of guys that will do well? It's a, it's a very relevant question. Um, quickly, what happened in 2008 is what I said, a lot of people say it was a Lehman crisis for India, mini Lehman or sort of Lehman moment for India. I, I said it, I say this, it's, it's a Northern Rock moment for India, basically mm -hmm. asset liability mismatches. So what happened is um, during the Ujit Patel regime in the beginning, 2016, 17, if you look at this, the rates are pretty low. Uh, the market rates I'm talking about, not, not of course, not comparable with post uh, demon, uh, post uh, uh, um, I, right now what we are seeing uh, after the pandemic, it's not comparable, but at that point of time, it's pretty low. So if you look at the NBFC balance sheets at that point of time in 2017 and 18, you will find they were borrowing short 90 day CP, rolling it over and lending it long. And that short-term borrowing as a percentage of their total borrowing, it for some of them were as high as even 40%. So when the when it started rising, then definitely they had to, uh, they, they were a problem. And governance also was a problem for certain entities like, say, let's, let's look at ILFS. The CEO all along ran it like a promoter as if it's own Jamindari. And then, then, he, then he quit like a professional uh, and doing everything which he should not have done. So that was, the, that was the story, NVFC story that led to the crisis. And then we, then we saw some of the NVFCs biting the dust. I think they learned the lessons. They have their capability. They have their ability uh, to reach out, which some of the banks do not have. 
uh, they have uh, they have the technology on the side again some of the banks do not have they have the products on their side so i think uh, and but what uh, and so in in some sense they have many many advantages so but, but what has changed the term for changing the term for nbfc is this rbi norm now rbi is no more soft touch regulator for nbfcs it's saying that look there will be much of a difference between banks and nbfcs at this point of time uh, the last uh, rbi circular um, well it is i think in november 14 uh, dated or 12 dated 14 dated something like that it what did it what did it say that it has been observed that nbfcs are pretty lax in recognizing their bad loans uh, date wise just to give an example today is what day today is 20 25 friday yeah. so i take a loan from you you are nbfc i am a borrower i take a loan from you on 25th friday uh, um, so this by the by that logic february uh, march april may by 24th uh, may uh, or because february is 28 days even earlier uh the first my first cycle that three months 90 days 90 days three months 90 days happens and i need to nbfc if i don't pay you nbfc need to uh classify me uh whatever it should but they are not doing it they have not been doing it whether you are taking a loan on 24th february or 14th february they are ending it this uh, entire february as if the loan was taken on the end of february so they'll give you march april may some 13 between 13 day 20 days 25 days kind of leeway and what was the reason because my cash flow is different i am a different entity i am not a corporate i am an msme or sme so on and so forth now rbi circular said look you have to stop that you can't do that so it is on that date like the banks are doing it and following and it's already in place following that you will see the nbfc's bad loans will go up so so there are it's it's while while technology is 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 a big help while their um, ability to reach out uh, to people is a big help uh, but then the reserve bank of india's shift in regulation and treating uh, nbfcs almost on a par with banks i think throws a big challenge so what we what would we see in future i would like to believe many of them or some of them would like to become bank either directly become universal bank or through the small finance bank route they will mm -hmm. uh, of course uh, the banks then the two things which you, which they which normally if you ask the new banks two things they they are they find it difficult one is how to build trust how to create trust and get the deposits and second the compliance the compliance is so huge the so called eod concept end of the day everything has to be finished and and like in apple a day keep a doctors uh, you know keep uh, keep you fit uh, keep the keep the diseases away similarly uh, rbi believes a direction a day is is good to keep you on your toes <laughs> so it's a huge compliance burden so those who are ready to those who have already established name uh, they can create trust and they can they are ready because compliance again as i said nbfc and banks the differences are uh, slowly obliterating so they they need to become banks they will become banks probably there will be other set which will be basically tech driven and getting into the other model kind of things and all and and yet there will be others who will probably can be used by the banking system as a uh, as a banking correspondent or or something else which like because they have their reach they have their technology and they have their uh, they have their um, branches so they can be an intermediation intermediate sort of intermediator but not in that form so uh, nbfc has been playing a pretty big role i think 30 odd trillion uh, uh, assets are the books of nbfcs but things are changing um, and there are there are many challenges and but if you are a well run nbfc which i i was like i will not name one particular entity he said look i i would like to remain an nbfc because yeah. the, the moment i become a bank apart from compliance and other things there it is it is the slr and crr and the capex of opening branches my mm -hmm. cost of money goes up so my if my business model is right 
if i'm then i'll be able to convince the banks to get money at the right price and i'm happy to get borrow money from the banks and do my business and keep my margin but those will be very very few those who are extremely com, uh, com, confident about their business model and about the ability to get money uh, banks cheap others i think one way of either you become a bank or you become technology driven different kind of nbfcs and the third way of you give up your nbfc role in that sense as a lender but become an intermediary and use uh, to to bridge the last mile for the banks hmm. so tamil i also have you know we've talked a lot about the lending side of financial services uh, you know maybe i'm biased but i have to talk to you about financialization of savings and how that trend is growing a larger younger population moving beyond fds for their investing needs uh, of course my industry is uh, you know a part of that change but how how do you see this no uh say this at this point of time if you talk about the savings etc if you if you do a, a travel and uh, tier 2 tier 3 cities and people are uh, people are not so even not so educated till recently crypto was a money guzzler <laughs> people were keeping money till yeah, till the uh, started on crypto yes, oh. yeah till the yeah yeah is yet another thing was there i mean crypto and then the past two years those who were who were never in the market they have been uh, they have turned dated as uh, you know sitting at home doing nothing have little money so if we can make money kind of thing and all so one of the reason is of course the the historic low interest rates i mean if you look at this Uh, i know some of the banks are offering i don't know now whether it has changed in the recent past 2.75 for the savings rate 2.75 for the savings rate yes there are banks which are offering 7% but i'm talking about uh, foreign banks i'm talking about large public sector banks 2.75 i mean tamil so, radhika gupta can do a home loan at a cheaper rate than probably state of maharashtra correct so you 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 look at yeah you look at your home loan which is typically 20 20 year loan at 6.4 or 6.5 which the 10 year government bond rate is higher than that so this is a, this how sustainable is this and then, then what what happens is this when the money becomes very cheap there is a possibility of misuse by the borrowers yeah. so and and then then uh, so on the one on the one hand we are we are being unfair to the savers because in a country where we do not have the safety net uh, like the developed market some of the developed market or most of the developed markets we are not those the the huge vast population who depend on their you know putting their uh, little pension or keeping their uh, savings in in bank deposits and and uh, and running their family with that kind of interest rates you you look at them the way the inflation is inflation does not reflect the numbers if you look at you buy sabji you you, you, you will see um, you know the other day i just there's a uh, i <laughs> because i don't buy i don't know but uh, but i found that uh, my cook in the evening he wanted to pay, she wanted to have a piece of pumpkin and there was one thela wala sabji mm. it's near my house so we on uh, tell the security can you bring bring uh, some pumpkin for us or a bit of pumpkin for us for whatever reason and our security picked up and all and i was told that 250 g is 25 rupees so a small piece i saw in the kitchen uh, we call lilu thai i said lilu thai pumpkin mil gaya i said yes yes to kitna liya uske liye the 25 rupees is not this small of pumpkin so 100 100 bucks a kilo so you, you can imagine i mean you can me make fun of it but those who really in that income segment so this is uh, this is a problem as you rightly pointed out this is a problem i mean how do you how do you generate savings and where do you channelize it etc incidentally you will find um, if you look at the uh, if you look at um, you ask your uh, data guys the backroom guys to see the share of retail investors in the in in all the listed entities has gone up the past two years mm. yes Because, it has yeah it has mm. uh, i'm not talking about the zero das and others which are also yeah, making yes, it easy it as a sort of vehicle using it so stock market is 
uh, was a lot of money has gone into the market now this uh, the latest thing what is happening whether it will make people nervous and risk averse and they will come back to the banking system and get thing i do not know mm. uh, crypto at red played its own role a uh, lot of people they are putting uh, i i know guys who have never played in stock market they on their uh, on their uh, mobile they flaunt the crypto and they said look i am plus this much i am plus this much etc et it became a fad so crypto has the money has gone into crypto of course reserve bank of india governor officially said that and that was in an, my interview on behalf of my paper i was doing last year said that both the numbers and number of people investing in crypto and the total money gone into crypto are hugely exaggerated they are not the numbers that the lobby is actually creating the hype okay but be that as it may uh, anecdotally i know people who are putting in money in crypto and then not anecdotally the data say that people are getting into stock market uh, and bank deposit growth has not been that case because of low interest rates so um, your concern is is very genuine i think we need to wait and watch how things pan out so that was the last question i have to ask you you know uh, you you've uh, been a journalist you've written so many books you've done six books by count uh, if i had to ask you very quickly uh, what's the next topic you're looking to write on so what's it's not lo- it's what's not the, lo- next, <laughs> what's the next book going to be about what's the topic that's catching your fancy yeah no no not catching it has caught my fancy and i have already actually i'm on the verge of finishing it because not for any reason because of uh, because of uh, covid time so again the second wave came and third wave came when the life was coming becoming normal uh, again we got homebound so i thought why waste time uh, uh-huh. so i i almost finished it and this is again on i i am i am barred from my publisher to talk about it but uh, i can only i can only assure you uh, this will be very 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 different from others uh from other books it's on banking and finance but the treatment is very different i mean you read it like a fiction people do say that i am a good storyteller i don't know who, whether i am or not but that's a public perception and if you feel that i am a good storyteller they, this story which i am going to tell uh, i i can assure you you'll enjoy it. and it's all about banking and finance but not about crr slr and inflation uh-huh. and and market stability etc etc it's something else i am going to line up to buy this one uh, i'm already excited fiction and finance uh, coming together in some new format this sounds very exciting i think you just crossed the one hour mark but uh, tamal thank you i could actually talk to you for hours i probably had five questions that i didn't uh, run through but uh, you know we got very deep and i think very frank perspective on banks um, payments nbfcs the whole space public sector so thank you for your depth and candor and it was a delight to have you so thank you so much for joining us and uh, thank you to everyone who listened in today thank you very much thank you thank you radhika for inviting me for this uh, you know i was in delhi and i cut short my delhi trip and came yes. to join and uh, thank you and stay safe you your your um, uh, your 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 colleagues your family and the entire audience and their family stay safe thank stay you. safe everyone and yes thank you tamal for coming from delhi for us really appreciate it <laughs> mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully